Hi everyone, Sandman here. Um, so I'm here doing a long form discussion today uh, with somebody who has actually made a documentary called Do Women Have a Higher Sex Drive? And I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, uh, my name is John Willem um, and uh, I'm a Dutch documentary filmmaker. And um, yes, I uh, recently made a documentary called Do Women Have a Higher Sex Drive? So tell me, uh, why did you actually make this film? And from your experience making it, uh, do you actually think that women do have a higher sex drive than men? Um, well, initially, um, I thought uh, it, it, it was impossible. What happened was I had three female interns at my company, and we were actually working on another film, uh, a, a fiction film. And we got into a discussion about sex drive. and. All three of them have shocked me because they all believed that women had a higher sex drive. Um, and, and at first I thought, you know, they were crazy, but then they, they came with uh, various reasons and that really got me uh, thinking. And then I was like, okay, uh, maybe we should actually make a documentary about this. So when I watched this film, um, I couldn't help but like thinking this film is full of red pill principles. So has MGTOW or the men's rights influence, I'm sorry, has the, MIG, has the MGTOW movement or the men's rights movement influenced this documentary in any way? Like, did, were you aware of us before you actually started making it? Um, well, actually, like in, in the research that we did, especially um, online, um, one of the people who talks the most about uh, gender and relationships and uh, sex drive um, is actually uh, you, uh, Sandman. Uh, so I, I find it quite ironic that indeed, um, when it comes to the dynamics of men and 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 women, that a man, uh, yeah, talks about it more when when uh, on YouTube, um, for articles online and so like psychology uh, today and so it's woman, but for YouTube, it's uh, you're the guy who talks about it the most. So when you guys found my channel, like, did you watch a bunch of videos and just kind of figure out, like, like what, what exactly did you do for research when you were listening to my stuff? Um, well, it, it's, it's not necessarily that, that we used you as, a, uh, uh, as a, a source of research, but what it is, is with MGTOW, is we saw that that was a reaction to what is happening um, in society. And um, one of the things that I realized, um, especially as a guy when um, examining the female sex drive is indeed how different men and women are and um, um, also um, how a lot of times men tend to project uh, views and ideas on women of how they are instead of looking uh, and 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 accepting them uh, for who they really are because once you really indeed begin to understand women and understand their point of view um, you begin to realize that there might definitely be some merit uh, in this hypothesis so when I was watching this I couldn't help but thinking that this film was made specifically for women because there were like it was you 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 didn't interview any men like I didn't find that there were very many men in the in the in the film itself and I found that most of the the women you interviewed they were they were more like cheerleaders you know kind of pumping up this idea that women have a higher sex drive almost in a comical way um, so like was that your intention or was it just the people you ended up finding that were willing to go on camera Oh, it's, um, it, it wasn't comical. And uh, what it is, is um, I think I interviewed, what is it, um, seven, uh, seven women. And um, I think two of them uh, believed that the, it was equal. So like it was equal between men and women. And the others believed that women did indeed uh, have a higher sex drive. And um, one of the things that I noticed um, when looking at women is that, um, yeah, how can I say this? Oh, it is very complex to be a woman and men definitely underestimate that. And the reason for this is because women grow up in a society where they are uh, told 
three different things at the same time. Uh, from birth, they are told by their father, uh, be a good girl, avoid sex, uh, try to remain a virgin for as long as possible. Uh, the media says the exact opposite. Go out there, be as wild uh, as you can. You know, you can be just like the men. And then you have uh, the girlfriends, uh, the fellow girlfriends who are like, well, if you sleep around, then, you know, we're going to gossip about you and uh, possibly ruin your life. And with men, it's a little more uh, simpler. It has gotten more complex um, in the last couple of years um, with the rise uh, or with the new rise of radical uh, feminism in the media, where it's like um, with guys, you have two, uh, two things that are being told to them. Uh, by their family, they're being told, go out there, uh, you know, score with as many uh, chicks as possible. Uh, but the media is telling us, um, you know, um, uh, don't talk to girls, d don't do anything uh, uh, funny. You might uh, make them sexually uncomfortable. Um, you know, you might be a harasser um, and, 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 you know, the dark sides of the Me Too movement. So, um, yeah, it's, it's when you understand um, the environment that women uh, grow up and you realize that women communicate their sexuality uh, very different than men. With men, it's like as a man, you have to go out there and get the woman. But what women do is they give signals and they give lots of signals and everything is more uh, indirect. Um, and yeah, they, they do do this indeed to, um, to, to, to try to appease all of the different uh, uh, um, uh, voices uh, 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 that tell them how to grow up, um, whether it be indeed their father, be a good girl, be a virgin. Um, so, um, yeah, they, 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 they signal more uh, um, indirectly and uh, men usually so you're, you're don't basically pick that up. You're, you're basically talking about when they play with their hair, or when they cross their legs, or they, you know, you're talking about all the subconscious signaling that they do. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And um, it, it even goes further than that, because one of the things um, that I discovered uh, uh, is not only do uh, women have a higher sex drive, but they're also more spiritual. And that was also something that I... Uh, could not believe because you know I'm I'm very scientific I'm very analytical and what it is is uh, the uh, presenter uh, of the uh, documentary Cheyenne she was like yeah women are spiritual and I was like you know you're crazy and then I interviewed a female historian and then she says yeah uh, women are spiritual and I was like what this woman is crazy um, so spiritual and then, in what sense um, um, in the sense that um, um, they view sex as um, a spiritual thing. And as a guy, um, I had a hard time understanding that. But um, eventually um, what happened was that after those two said it, I was still skeptical. But then I saw an interview um, of an 80s porn star called Kay Parker. And she also um, described the sex as spiritual. And at that point, I realized that, okay, if all these three women are, different women are saying the same thing, there must be something behind that. So then I began to research the female orgasm. And what I found really uh, blew my mind. So the uh, one of the biggest differences between men and women can be seen in the female orgasm. Even though both orgasms, average orgasms are the same. If we are comparing the best of the best, then uh, the difference becomes very large. You can compare a male orgasm to going to um, a McDonald's. It's quick, it's cheap, it's fast, it doesn't cost a lot of time or money. But a female orgasm is like a five-star course meal. Um, so what it is, is in order to um, take a five-star course meal, you have to make time, um, you know, you have to, if you have kids, you have to, you know, find a babysitter and then you have to go to the restaurant and like, it's, it, it's like a whole 
thing, you know, you can't just go in and out. And that's what, what the female orgasm for a lot of women is like. And in the beginning, before I made this documentary, I used to hypothesize where it's like, well, if women do have a higher sex drive, why aren't they showing it? Why aren't they addicted to their orgasms if their orgasms are so much better? But then in making this documentary, I realized that even though the female orgasm is so much better and so much more powerful, um, for them it's a lot, and I mean a lot harder to reach. But once they actually reach uh, or are able to reach full body orgasms, what happens is in the mind, almost everything shuts down. So for example, if you were to um, present a neurosurgeon, a picture of a woman at the height of her orgasm, um, the neurosurgeon, if, if you didn't, you know, give any background, you'd be, uh, they'd be like, oh my gosh, this woman is about to die, or this woman is almost brain dead, because almost, uh, 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 Almost her entire brain shuts down. And then what happens is um, that is what they experience as almost an outer body um, experience where they kind of let everything go and um, are, are not bothered or are not focused about anything that is happening around them. And then that is what they perceive as spiritual because indeed the spiritual is something where you leave the world worldly things behind and that is something that women are able to experience far more than men okay so you're basically saying that they they perceive it as something completely different than men but i i mean as a man i find that uh when i have an orgasm i lose touch with reality completely for i don't know three to five to ten seconds and i'm completely disconnected from the world so how would you yeah so yeah, it, it, isn't that the that, same thing? Um, that's cute, five to ten seconds, but try uh, uh, up to five minutes or try sometimes even uh, ten minutes. Um, try losing connection for that long and then also with um, sometimes even three times or five times the intensity. That is what women go through. And the very interesting thing is that... Um, almost all uh, functions of the brain shut down, including the memory. So in my research, when I began asking women about their orgasms, their powerful orgasms, they couldn't give it a they couldn't give a description because their memory shuts down. So they're having these wonderful experiences, but then later, you know, they can't uh, re recall the actual experience because in the experience itself, the portions of the brain that contain memory also shut down. So basically what you're saying is women have orgasms, but they can't remember them. <laughs> So yeah, so what's they, 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 they can't they can't remember him as 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 we would understand memory where it's like they can properly describe uh, um, the, the 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 experience. They, they really go blank. It's um, if you have a girlfriend or, or a wife, ask them uh, to describe their most powerful orgasms and um, the actual experience that they go through and then. Uh, most of them, you'll realize they'll turn blank. They'll be like, "I don't know," but it did feel good. So yeah, that's that's something that uh, that woman experienced that is uh, is definitely more uh, more intensive and definitely very different from men in in the intensity and also what happens in the brain. Now, do vibrators give them the same types of orgasms that they get with physical men, or is it just uh, or is one different than the other? Did you actually research any of that? Oh, that's a very interesting uh, question. Well, the good news is that uh, uh, vibrators can never replace men. What it is, is um, women are more emotional. And uh, um, even in the brain, so if, if you look at the, the, the brain um, uh, uh, function, uh, the emotional part of it is actually better developed uh, uh, than men. Um, so what it is, is, um, as I mentioned before, it's like a five star uh, restaurant. It's you can't cheat your way into a good orgasm. They are able indeed to um, to have great orgasms 
with vibrators, but there must always be an uh, an, an emotional uh, attachment, either that they are able to conjure it in their fantasy or uh, or in reality um, uh, that they are with uh, with a man uh, that gives them the feeling. So it's not the size of the dick, it's not the thrust of the dick, it's how she interprets uh, the man, how she interprets uh, the man's emotions and vibes um, that really um, uh, can take a woman into ecstasy okay so so when she's fantasizing that pretty much can do the exact same thing in many ways yes it, it is possible but but like i said it's um it's uh it's not easy it's um if it was easy then probably a lot of women uh would be using that technique you know why bother with a man uh, when you can, you know, uh, just use a vibrator and get the same stuff, but um, it doesn't work like that. It's really a five-course meal, so okay. there is no easy way to uh, um, to get an orgasm. So, what well, you were also talking about uh, towards the end of the documentary, you actually mentioned um, that throughout most of history, most men didn't reproduce. So it was basically women selecting the best men and reproducing with those guys. Uh, so why didn't you actually ask any males? Like, like, why, like this documentary, why was it from a female perspective and you didn't really go into the male side of things? Because we already know the male side. It's, um, uh, that's one of the reasons. So I purposely wanted to interview women because like, we already know uh, what men think about uh, uh, women, but we don't know uh, what women think about their own sexuality. If we did, then it would have already been known that women had a higher sex drive. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I um, uh, why I purposely uh, wanted to interview women to get their side, so that people and uh, and men can understand what women go through. But one of the things that I realized and that I found really shocking, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> that I found really shocking was um, uh, the part indeed, as you mentioned, um, about the female sexual preference. Women are a lot pickier. And what most people don't know is that the more freedom you give women, the more polygamy will become popular. So that's one man and multiple women. But the thing is that um, a lot of men, when they hear polygamy, they think, oh, hey, I'm going to get two women. But the reality is that in polygamy, the George Clooney's, uh, the Ryan Gosling's, the, the Brad Pitt's, they are the ones who will get all the women. So what you're seeing um, um, in society is more the more and more freedom uh, women get, the pickier they become, and the more men are left behind. Add on top of that what is happening education-wise, where women usually do not date down. They either date someone who is equal or someone who is better. So what is happening in the universities is that you know some uh, some universities are almost becoming 70% uh, women, and then all of those women want the same quality guy as them or higher. So more and more men are being left out. And this is something I think that is also sparking uh, the MGTOW movement, where uh, part of the MGTOW movement is a reaction of more and more women rejecting men. But th the most horrifying thing that I discovered um, uh, in the documentary is that in the past, I was able to, uh, to say to a guy, just be yourself, that's good enough, you will find a woman. But now this is becoming more and more impossible for a larger percentage of the male population. So the lower 10 or 20 percent of the male population, for them, just being themselves is not good enough for women anymore. Because um, the, the reality is that we actually have always had this polygamous model, it's only when uh, marriage became institutionalized um, that every uh, woman was basically uh, forced 
um, to marry um, every man, and that allowed um, every man indeed to have a wife. But with the um, breakdown of the marriage structure, this this paradigm um, is gone, and you know women are more pickier. Uh, the eighty twenty principle. So yeah, w what I see happening in society is very troublesome and very uh, very worrisome, and also you know ties into the fact of these incels involuntary celibacy which is also growing and i see that the media um they, they really kind of like dismiss or make fun of the incels but this is one of the fastest growing uh, uh, uh demographics where indeed you know if you're not good enough for a woman what 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 can you do you know so that is something that that really does worry me okay so what where do you see things heading based on based on what you're seeing um well i didn't want to end the documentary um in a negative um but what i actually see happening um is that we've actually entered a gender war i would like to say that we're heading to a gender war but we've already entered um a gender war and what it is um uh, what i mean was a gender war is not that um, men and women are fighting each other on the street or stabbing each other or shooting each other. What I mean with a gender war is that um, I'm talking about isolation and extreme isolation where men and women are becoming more isolated and um, are becoming more hateful and resentful um, uh, towards um, each other. So um, I, see, I see this already happening that indeed um, um, even though, um, even though if it's up to women, the, the entire society will be polygamous, but the reality is that the alpha males, you know, they mostly marry. So, um, what it is, is, uh, with the 80, 20 principle, um, both men and women are screwed because, for every every time a woman uh, rejects um, a man in the hope of finding a alpha man, um, that man is single, but that also means that that woman is single. So what we're having is we're seeing mo more and more an increase uh, in, in, in singleness, and that is becoming the norm. And this has indeed uh, um, also uh, contributed indeed to MGTOWER, men are realizing like hey you know what's what's going on uh screw this i'm going my own way and um in doing that every man that is single also leads to almost uh um, every woman also being uh single so yeah it, it um it, it really does worry me Okay, so you're ba like I mean a lot of the stuff you're talking about we've covered over like I've gone over many many times, and I'm just trying to I'm trying to find some new angles on this because like I mean you're, you're right there is a gender war going on it's not it's not a hot war it's more of a cold war where you're seeing men and women fighting it out but they're not fighting it out directly you know like, I mean I'm in some ways they are like you look at like the Me Too movement you're seeing a huge number of women in, you know, academia, like, getting educations over men, so they're basically, you know, taking over the workforce, at least the jobs that they want. And then all, you're also seeing um, politics changing. Like, I, I was doing, a, doing some research today for a video I'm putting together with regards to politics, and um, a lot of, like, by 2037, 50% of the politicians in the world will be women. So... And at that point, my thinking is that once you have that tipping point, that, you know, you have political parties and they all vote, you know, each party member votes with his party. But what happens when you have two, three parties, but 50% of the people in those three parties in the, in, the, in the Senate or the House or whatever it is, are all women? And a piece of legislation gets brought up that benefits women. Then you're going to see women voting, to, voting their feelings, voting towards what women want. And, you know, if, if the men in their parties don't toe the line, then, you know, there could be trouble for the men as well. So, you, you, you know, once we get to the point where women make up the majority of the politicians, they're just going to vote everything in that they want. 
and that's going to destroy our civilization com completely at that point. That's I mean it, that's that's my biggest fear at this point. It it it's I partly agree with you, and uh, I'll give some examples, and I will also talk about uh, what my perspective is and how it's uh, different uh, than most uh, the new angle that is not really uh, uh, talked about a lot. Um, a brief example in two thousand and ten um, in Iceland, um, a uh, feminist lesbian, uh, I think it was uh, uh, prime minister. Uh, prime minister. Yeah. Um, she um, she banned uh, strip clubs and she also wanted to ban uh, uh, porn and this was actually uh, done to spite men to 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 get back at men yeah um, uh, um, so so indeed um, um, that women are in charge is not a problem that radical feminist women are in charge is a serious uh, yeah, but how do you tell um, the difference uh, between them, the two? Mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference between the two? Yeah, that's the problem. It's like in the beginning, um, I used to say I was left, and I used to say I was feminist. But now, you know, um, things are becoming more blurry, and I consider myself the middle. I I can't call myself a feminist anymore because what it is is that a lot of feminists. Sorry, a lot of feminists aren't calling out radical feminists. You know what I mean? It's like they, they, they give them platforms. It's recently, for example, I think it was in um, uh, in the Washington Post, um, uh, a, a, um, a, a very large uh, newspaper, and I, I think it has millions of readers, um, a, a radical feminist posted a story, Why I Can't Hate Men. And she talked about literally... Uh, taking away the rights of men that she believed that men should not be allowed to vote. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world can this newspaper allow such a piece? Aren't there any, uh, aren't there any, you know, logical people um, who, who, who are stopping her from writing this? And what are the consequences? What are the blowbacks? How can we tolerate such language? If it was the opposite, you know, we would have uh, riots in the street. Um, so I do indeed see a lot of things happening. And what my uh, unique perspective about it is, is that the main problem and the root of all of this, uh, this polarization between men and women is not patriarchy and is actually not radical feminism. The main problem is actually technology. What it is, is that in the past, gender roles used to be more defined and that was uh, necessary for survival. So if we go back, for example, to the Stone Age, it's like men had the protection uh, uh, provider role um, and women um, had to uh, raise the babies um, and, and, and take care of the social unit at home while the men went out hunting. Uh, but as technology grew, what it is is that those gender roles um, were not were not uh, strictly defined. Like borders uh, disappeared, so um, women could go into male professions. And one of the things um, um, that that I realized in making this documentary is that a lot of behaviors that we today pathologize, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, am I saying it correctly? Pathologize. Patholo yeah, patho can you say it again? Pathologize. Yeah, pathologize, um, actually have their roots in historical logic. So for example, one of the reasons why women are more emotional is because babies cannot talk. Um, so if you were to logically raise a baby, you're going to have a very hard time. But if you can understand their feelings and understand what the baby wants, you are able to give it what it needs. And that's where those brain differences come in. And this is great for babies. But if you take uh, those same uh, uh, um, emotional feelings and you go into uh, the work environment where it's about profit margins um, um, and, and you know you're dealing with a lot of men then these uh, then these classical instinctive traits uh, become negatives and uh, also vice versa where 
uh, we used to in the Stone Age uh, uh, bring meat, uh, which was very nutrition, which was very high in nutrition. We used to bring that back to the tribe, and in order to bring meat, we had to kill. So we had to have the killer instinct. We had to be violent. That's how our brains grew. That's why we're smarter. Predators are always smarter than prey. But this is also becoming pathologized uh, in today's society where it's like toxic masculinity uh, and and violence. So um, the the main problem is technology, but the problem is- I would would disagree with you on that, with the whole idea that the predator is smarter than the prey. I think in this case, yes, men are predators when it comes to going out and killing things and bringing back food. But the problem is women are predators when it comes to catching men. So oh, uh, uh, I, I was um, I, I was not talking about uh, predator versus prey woman. No, I was talking about uh, humans as a whole. That's uh, uh, um, uh, okay. for example why lions are smarter than 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 zebras. So I was not talking about predator prey uh, woman. It's I I do understand the power uh, um, of women and um, I, I do understand that. Um, th- this might sound uh, controversial, but um, um, that women, on average, indeed, are actually smarter than men. But if you know, if you start looking at uh, at, at the edges, so yeah. at the very top and the very bottom, uh, we do see that men occupy both edges. As in, yeah. there are uh, double, uh, uh, twice as many geniuses, but there are also twice as many idiots. Uh, um, There's in more that variety. Field. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, where where were we? So you basically were talking about men being or humans in general being predators, and I that's pretty much all I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so what I mean indeed is humans that in general that like um, the one of the reasons why we are so smart is because we had to learn how to kill. If we were vegetarians as a whole, uh, you know, we we would be less smart. So one of the things that has happened is indeed that we have started to pathologize male behavior that, you know, in the past got us to where uh, to where we need to be. So um, it's 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 a very dangerous game. And one of the things, um, for example, trigger warnings, trigger warnings and safe spaces, that is very new for men. But the reality is that for women, this is not new. This is uh, how they've been operating all of their life. The the the, the increase in trigger spaces and safe. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the increase in uh, uh, trigger warnings and safe spaces is because women are entering uh, uh, male spaces uh, that you know have previously been only male dominated. And what they're doing, um, without knowing it, it's almost subconsciously. Um, what they're doing is they're trying to create an environment in order to have a baby where, you know, in the past, it's like, you know, women would stay uh, in, in, in the tribe huts and in the tribe areas, and they would try to make the area as safe as possible so that they can become pregnant and then have babies and then continue to make it as safe as possible so that their babies wouldn't get bitten by uh, snakes, wouldn't eat the wrong uh, food and die. So these triggers uh, warnings and safe spaces were great uh, thousands of years ago um, in the Stone Age, and that's how they developed. But um, you know, unfortunately, we can't. Uh, women can't just turn off their uh, natural instinctive biology um, when they enter uh, the male workforce. Well, I mean, look at it. I, I think of it this way. I mean, women are starting to dominate so many different parts of the world and so many, you know, academia and the workforce and just everything in general. So all of a sudden they're going to try to make every space safe. And so there will be no safe spaces for men, like in terms of environments where men can just be men because they see that as a threat. So they have to, they have to tone police and they have to control every single environment and make sure that, you know, nothing out of their control can actually happen in that environment. And that's basically yeah. pushing a lot of men away. So where do you see this? Where do we see happening in the future based on what you're seeing happening right now? 
Well, I, I see that things are actually getting worse. And um, one of the things is I never wanted to get involved in the whole gender uh, aspect of it. I, I never thought, you know, that I would even make a, a documentary about this. But what it is, is that people and everybody who's listening is we need to become active. We need to become political. And one of the things that we can, for example, currently do um, today is start uh fact-checking uh, um, uh, feminist courses and feminist theories because uh, without realizing it, uh, every month at least hundreds and hundreds of women are being indoctrinated um, um, in, in ideas um, that are negative towards uh, males that, you know, um, perpetuate the whole victimhood status. And what it is is that even though most of the women who take gender studies uh, won't end up as CEOs or as politicians, some of them will. And some of them will indeed um, uh, try and, uh, um, and and bring out their, their influence uh, on men, which will further divide things. So I do see things getting worse, um, worse and worse. So I really think that, you know, it, this is a time where it's like uh, we have to become active. And as I mentioned before, the example uh, with Iceland, where it's like walking away and saying like, ah, um, I'm just going to put my hands up and I'm just going to let the world fall and burn. It doesn't work like that because, you know, eventually you too will get affected. Um, you know, Iceland banned, luckily it was overturned later, but Iceland banned strip clubs and tried to ban uh, porn. Good luck trying to be a MGTOW without strip clubs uh, and porn, you know what I mean? So um, what it is, is with the radical feminists, it really is a zero sum game where they want total control. And what I'm hoping for is that more and more people in the middle and reasonable people on the left and reasonable people on the right uh, will start to address these issues of the radical feminists and will also um, uh, try to understand what is happening in the environment, that we are indeed aware of our uh, uh, biology, that indeed all of these trigger warnings and safe spaces, they they come from a good place, but they are not where they need uh, where they need to be. And um, so, for example, my, my only criticism um, uh, of women, I, I'll first start with uh, with a good thing. But my only criticism of women is because they are more emotional, they are able to love more. So, women are able to love their child like no other, like a mother's love for their sons or daughters um, can actually go far beyond a, a, a father's love. But one thing that I also notice is that because they are able to love more than, than, than anybody else, it also goes the other side, the, the, the opposite side. So um, uh, you have no idea how many times I've told women and also my sisters where it's like, don't hate that person just because you feel like hating that person. Um, use use logic. And what we're seeing now is indeed that with the increase of female uh, power and then the uh, increase of radical feminism that is influencing and that is steering that, that indeed um, things are becoming less logical and based more indeed on emotions. And that is a very bad thing. It's great to love your child, but outside of, 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 uh, of loving your child and outside of the family unit, it's really best to remain logical and to give everyone a fair chance instead of giving in to these radical ideologies of uh, patriarchy and oppression and lies about uh, the, the wage gap and so on and so forth. I agree with you, but I mean, I, I honestly don't think that um, we can really be presenting solutions. I think, you know, the problem is people are going to do what they feel is right and what feels good for them. So if you give people solutions that are based on reason and rationality, they're not going to follow them. You know, it's it's not, it's like 
you could give people, you could give a person the best course of action, but if they feel that it's wrong, they're just not going to, they're not going to take that course of action. So if you have a society where women take the majority of the power, they're not going to do what's in the best interest of that society. They're going to do what's in the best interests and what they feel is in the best interest of that society. And that society is eventually going to crumble. That's why a lot of the guys who are going their own way do, like see no point in, in trying to fight this and trying to create change because they know you can't, you can't rationalize with an emotional woman. It's just impossible. So the only thing you can do is just sit back and watch it collapse and then those same women that are irrational now and emotional and think that they're stronger are going to come to you and they're going to be emotionally scared and they're going to they're going to ask you for your help but you're going to basically get something out of that deal and, that, and that, I think that's why a lot of guys are actually sitting on the sidelines and saying to themselves you know what there's no point in 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 society and taking part in society anymore because and we could come up with the best ideas. We could we could basically try to implement those ideas, but we'll be thwarted at every turn by people who are emotional, you know. And and there's nothing we can do about that. So, in my opinion, you know, people always say there's the there's patriarchy, and then there's this current feminist kind of egalitarian sort of world that we live in right now. I don't believe that there ever was patriarchy in the sense that men had authority. The only reason that men had authority in our society was because women gave men authority. Women have always had the authority over men. It's just that now they don't need us to take authority in certain areas because you know, they can take authority in, in certain ways and they're just taking back their power that they gifted us in order, in order for us to do things that they couldn't. Now that they can do those things or they think they can do those things, they're taking back their power. And you know, my, my interpretation of all of this is I think that what's going to happen in the end is men are basically fighting for, they're fighting right now for power for the first time in history. We've been completely powerless because we've been driven by our emotions to procreate and we've been driven basically on our white knighting behavior to protect and provide for women. It, once we can detach from that, I think we have, a, we have an opportunity to, to free ourselves completely. And if we can create things like artificial wombs and lover bots and all that kind of stuff, then we can we can we can permanently free ourselves from women. And I think that's why we're seeing um, you know so much hatred towards things like MGTOW and incel and all of this because women women feel they understand based on their feelings that this isn't a good thing for them. They kind of understand that you know you know what's happening you know like under the surface they know that m if men become free. And men realize that they've been oppressed for all, like for pretty much the entirety of our existence as a species, that the game is over. And, and that's why they have to prevent things from like lover bots from coming out. I mean, recently they, there was an article that I read. They said that uh, sex dolls, there's a risk for men to get STDs from sex dolls. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, <laughs> this is just absolutely insane. You know, why would somebody write a, an article like this? And it has nothing to do with rationality. It has to do with trying to get men scared of such technology so they don't use them. You know, they're, they're saying things like, well, if men use sex dolls, then what's going to happen is those men are going to be damaged and then they won't be able to have relationships with real women. And, you know, they're trying to scare men away from those things so that, you know, they can actually be with a real woman. But what they don't realize is that once those technologies become good enough, to, to replace women, the, the game is over. So, like, I'd like you to uh, comment on those things I just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, indeed, one thing that I noticed is that there is a very, very deep fear that women have of, uh, um, of, 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 of sex robots, especially the advanced ones. So, not necessarily um, lifeless sex dolls, but, like, I'm talking more heading in the direction of Westworld. Um, there is a very, very like almost like gut deep uh, eternal fear, and this is not indeed totally unwarranted. Um, so what I want to talk about briefly is indeed uh, sexual revolutions and a broader perspective on things. The last two sexual revolutions that we had were the pill um, and was porn, and both changed the gender dynamics. So every time 
that there is a sexual revolution, the power shifts one way or the other. With the pill, the power shifted towards women. Um, and then with porn, the power shifted a little bit towards men. But one of the things that women don't fully realize is that current technology benefits women more than men. But that is about to change because the next three, uh, uh, the next three sexual revolutions uh, will be tilted uh, uh, more in men's favor. And the next three revolutions are the following. Um, in the next 10 years, roughly speaking, uh, male contraception is going to go mainstream. Currently, um, they, are, uh, they are in the testing phase of non-hormonal male contraception. And that has always been the holy grail because hormonal contraception for males have existed for more than 20 years, but it have, had negative side effects. Have you ever heard Not, of the, have you ever heard of the BMIC SLV before? Uh, no, what's that? Okay, there's a guy who, I, I think his last name is BMIC. Uh, he's in Europe somewhere and he created a valve that you basically uh, connect to the tubes that come out of your testicles. Oh and, yeah, yeah. I've 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 seen that video that you did. Yeah. Yeah, you can switch it on and off. So, you know, I mean, that to me is the most innovative technology because it's it's like a what do you call it? A vasectomy, but it's reversible and you have the option to turn it on and off. And True, but but I I don't think that men will adopt that on mass because it's invasive um, and it, 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 it does require surgery. But uh, pills, for example, that indeed uh, through non-hormonal ways uh, that, that target the specific uh, vitamin um, that is used to make sperm, that I think will be a real game changer because um, it's just taking a pill. You know, it, it, it lowers the effort, it lowers the risk, it's just taking the pill. And because it's non-hormonal, what will happen is uh, that the more and more men will start using it, the more women will stop using uh, their, um, their hormonal birth control. Because one of the things that I also talk about in the documentary is how uh, hormones have effect on women, how even the slightest changes in hormones yes. uh, can change uh, a woman's behavior. Yep. So, uh, so currently, what what we're seeing today, if we look at women in the West and and women that are on uh, hormone pills, they are not in their natural state. No, um, I'm I'm not saying that that they're crazy, but um, it it does affect them. Like um, their body the, tricks them into thinking they're pregnant. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and, and, and that does have an effect because they don't have ovulations anymore. And for a lot of women, it actually uh, lowers their sex drives, increases mood swings. Um, so, so these are serious issues and that will, uh, will be resolved when uh, the male uh, uh, non-hormonal pill goes mainstream. So I do think that that will be um, a game changer where um, the, uh, the the responsibility and control over uh, 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 um, uh, birth control will will uh, enter the male hands. I mean, um, so this has been talked about for the last five to ten years, especially in the MGTOW circles, and nothing has happened. I mean, I mean, I think if each guy wants to do it individually, he can go and get his BMIC SLV and put it in and not have to worry about that. Or he can basically get a vasectomy and not worry about it. I, I know a lot of guys get vasectomies. So, I mean, the techno it's not so much the, the convenience of it and the pill and all this kind of stuff. I think, I, think, I think it's just men don't really care as much about this kind of stuff as women do. Like control over reproduction. We're more worried about, you know, being f falsely accused at this point than control over reproduction in many ways. Um, but maybe at this point, men are more worried indeed about uh, being falsely accused. But one of the things that I think and that I as a man and I think a lot of men think it's like you don't want to raise a child um, that, that, that you don't want in the world. So, for example, if you're with a girl um, and, and you don't want children and then she decides to have children, that is a life changing uh, uh, um, uh, thing. So uh, a lot of men also have the fear of being uh, trapped or raising someone else's child. And um, a, a while back, a couple of years ago, like a study was done, I think it was in America, that like 
ten percent uh, uh, um, of 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 men are are raising someone else's child. So it could be up to twenty percent. Uh, yeah. So did yeah what? It could be up to twenty percent. Yeah. So 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 this thing is, is not a a slight issue. It's it's one of the worst fears that men can have. You know, being uh, being. Uh, cuckolded um, in in that kind of form. So I do think that men uh, indeed do want uh, control over uh, um, uh, um, over their fertility. Uh, I'm sh- I'm I know I want it, and I know that like if I'm in a relationship and she has all of the control, so she can decide. Even if I say I don't want to have a baby, and she decides too, then that is stuck with you for the rest of your life. You know, it, it literally changes your life. So I, I do think that um, there is uh, uh, there, there is a need and a want uh, for 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 male fertility. But um, it also depends, you know, on how it's pushed out into the public uh, and, and how how it's implemented. Um, uh, but um, the non-hormonal thing is very new so like they are now doing the first human test as in um i think maybe what is it um uh like a couple of weeks ago like i I saw a ted talk so like we're we're really in the uh, early stages the very first stages of the first non-hormonal uh, birth control pill. So this is something that is totally different from all of the other birth control pills uh, um, uh, from the past. Okay, um, so so what's the next part of the sexual revolution you were yeah, talking about? Uh, the next part of the sexual revolution is the 3D porn revolution. And um, Are you talking it, about augmented reality or are you talking about virtual reality? Um, virtual reality is an aspect of that. Uh, what I mean with 3D porn is that in a roughly 10 years time, porn will become so realistic uh, uh, that, that, that we will have passed the uncanny valley. And what it is is that... Are you talking about 3D rendered uh, people or are you talking about porn in general? Because it already has technically passed the uncanny valley if you're looking at an image. Yeah, yeah. It, um, uh, there are already examples um, of uh, of three D uh, renders that are, that have passed the uncanny valley. Uh, but what I mean is that a combination of three uh, technologies. One is indeed graphical power. Um, two is interface, and three is text to speech. So the text to speech is what happened with Google. Uh, um, I think it was a month ago, where you had Google Assistant who uh, was able to imitate a female voice and uh, make an appointment. Um, so th- that is the type of text to speech that will be uh, perfected and will all be combined. And w- what I mean with the 3D porn uh, revolution is that the average person will be able to make 3D porn. And this might sound strange, but a couple of years ago, um, I was looking at the statistics on Pornhub and I was looking in Sweden and I found something really interesting. Something the, happened the, to your microphone. It, the level dropped all of a sudden. Oh, weird. Um, test, test, one, two. Can you hear me now? Now it's better, yeah. Okay. Um, um, should I start with Pornhub from the beginning? Just start or there. Where the... Just start there. Okay, yeah. So um, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was looking at this at the statistics of Pornhub, and I found something really interesting that um, the number one uh, uh, searched keyword was Overwatch. And at first I ignored it, and then I I saw another article uh, that was written about it, and I ignored it. But what is happening now is a silent revolution is happening right under our feet where average people who normally would have no 3D uh, affiliation are making um, 3D porn. And what it is, is that um, uh, there was a program called, uh, I think it was Source Filmmaker. And what it was is um, it allowed the average person with no 3D background to uh, create 3D porn. And once we uh, um, once we are able to combine both graphical power, uh, text-to-speech, 
and a program uh, that is integrated where the average person can interact with it, what is going to happen is celebrity porn is going to become the norm where um, people will upload uh, either via torrent or via other sites. Um, uh, they will upload um, um, files of celebrities um, and then ordinary people will be able to animate and control and make celebrities do whatever they want. And this is a game changer because the average porn cannot compete with that. Um, um, I, I, I won't give any names, but say, for example, if you are given a choice between watching some, some uh, Russian uh, uh, girl or a famous celebrity do some freaky stuff, what will most people do? Most people will choose the celebrity. So that will totally change um, uh, uh, change the, the dynamics of porn and um, will unfortunately also um, uh, have a, how can I say it, have a, have a impact on women's sexual marketplace value, as in that will be the first step in the, uh, in the synthesization of, uh, of uh, a woman's sexual marketplace value, where in the past it's like um, if, if you want to see a female celebrity, you either have to pay them and you have to watch them on the big screen, but in 10 years' time, you'll be able to control your own. And that, indeed, will then also lead to the virtual aspect of it. Um, so that is the second uh, sexual revolution. And the third is one that you, indeed, talk about a lot, and that is sex robots. And that will happen, I think, roughly uh, 30 years from now, where it will be um, commercially viable, where the price will be low enough that um, a, a lot of men are going to interact uh, with this. And this will also have a major effect on how men and women interact with each other. See, from my opinion, I think that uh, when it comes to making predictions, we can never make accurate predictions about the future because we don't understand what we don't understand. You know, you're, you're seeing a world you're visualizing what you think is going to happen based on current trends and what you see around you. But what always happens is someone invents something that throws you throws everything out of whack. Like, let's say 15 years ago, let's say it's 2003, 2004. Could any of, anyone have predicted that we would have tablets and smartphones that you can touch and swipe? Absolutely not. Nobody, nobody had any idea that that would even come out. We, I mean, we had cell phones. We... We could text, we had little keyboards on them, but the fact that all of that's gone, you know, all those little keyboards, the black, you know, who would have thought BlackBerry 15 years ago was going to go bankrupt or close to it, right? Nope, nobody predicted that. So what I'm saying, it's very hard to predict um, what's going to happen in terms of s the sexual revolution and sexual marketplace value. But what we see right now is we see things like Tinder changing things completely because um, it's opening up a wider pool of men for women. So that's actually increasing women's pickiness and it's allowing them to be picky because, you know, so what? If she lets, you know, some great guy slip through her fingers, there's another hundred guys on Tinder that she can go connect with tomorrow and one of them might be better, right? So and what I don't think women understand is that there's a lot of competition between women for the top guys. You know, just like um, you know, the 80-20 rule and, you know, 80% of the guys are, you know, are not going to get any, any action and the 20% are. What, what those 80% of women, like you mentioned earlier, don't realize is that only 20% of them can actually get those 20% of guys out there because, because the marriage laws, right? So what's, yeah. what's going to happen when you have, I don't know, 50, 60, 70% of women in our society unmarried, no children with unreal, unrealistic expectations? And all of a sudden, the birth rates start to collapse. And we're not talking about just in the West. We're talking about in other countries because we're exporting the same technologies to other countries. So, you know, eventually other countries are going to catch up. You know, if you look at the Muslim world, if you look at where Islam is, is there, you're actually seeing birth rates falling faster than they are in the, in the Western world. And no one's actually really talking about that. They're all saying, well, look, people in... Saudi Arabia are having three kids. That's great. 
you know, but in 1970, 75, they were having 10 kids, right? So you're looking at a huge drop off uh, that, you know, no one's really discussing and no one's really talking about. So I don't think that, that you know, these sexual revolutionary things for men, the technologies are, are having as big of an impact as uh, things like Tinder, which are, you know, relatively simple and straightforward, but they're, they're, they're changing society, they're rewiring society in a completely different way. Without those, like if, if we want to have a stable population, we can't have social media. Like if we, if we want to have a society like we've had in the past, then we have to get rid of social media and we have to get rid of Tinder and we have to get rid of all those options that women have. But they aren't going to give up their, their smartphones with Tinder. So that means we can't, we can't force them to give up that technology. We can't destroy it. So what does that mean for the future? Like what do you, what do you think in terms of birth rates and what do you think in terms of like the you know population declining and then on top of that we have a banking system that keeps growing and if it doesn't grow it collapses so you know these sexual dynamics that are playing out this sexual marketplace forces could literally topple our entire civilization like what do you what do you think about that yeah it's it's, it's kind of you're actually going back to what i said in the beginning that the main problem with all of these polarizations is technology and um, um, even though we can't accurately predict what exact date uh, um, uh, the, these massive uh, um, jumps in technology uh, will come they will indeed have impact one of the things though that um, I'm actually not that worried about is the decrease in uh, in population and the reason why is because um, for the longest time, people have thought that um, uh, life extension and immortality were a pipe dream. Um, but in recent years, um, uh, this, this is becoming uh, more and more a reality. Just as other technologies are progressing, um, scientists have discovered that there are actually several animals that are immortal. Um, which means there is something in their uh, DNA, something in their genes um, that allows them to have this. And even though we sequence the human genome, we do not fully understand all of the functions. But because of artificial intelligence, we are slowly but surely beginning to do this. And especially China is in the forefront of this. They are running massive experiments on genes, uh, tur turning certain genes on and off uh, in animals to see uh, what happens. So eventually, um, uh, what it is, um, um, I don't know if, are you a little bit familiar with artificial intelligence and how it works? I mean, I've looked at all the stuff that talks about neural nets and basically trying to get um, artificial intelligence to teach itself certain things, but I, I don't know enough about it to really comment. And I don't, like, I mean, I'm kind of skeptical about us being able to create, you know, consciousness without even understanding what consciousness is. We don't really know what it is. So oh, I'm, 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 I'm talking about consciousness, and, and I don't believe in that whole thing that you can transplant your, your, your mind into a machine thing. No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, editing the genes to extend life and to stop aging uh, the same way animals have done. Just in the past that we've... we've so which animals have actually stopped aging? Mm -hmm. Which animals have stopped aging? Um, uh, let's see, there are certain fish uh, um, that do not age, there are certain jellyfish that do not age, and some suspect, but they're not sure, but there are also certain whales uh, and turtles uh, that do not age. So, so how, long happens, mm -hmm? how long do they um, live? How long do they live? Like, uh, technically uh, forever. What happens is, um, um, if they die, then it's uh, due to uh, uh, disease or um, or uh, that they get eaten uh, by 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 predators, but it's not the natural uh, decay of aging. So, for example, there are actually currently now whales still swimming uh, with um, uh, with uh, what do you call that uh, with harpoons in them from from 200 years ago. Um, so th there are certain indeed certain uh, animals. Um, th th that fit that uh, um, immortality thing. We definitely know about certain fish and s certain jellyfish. Um, with whales, we're not sure uh, 100%. Uh, and with turtles, we're also not sure 100% um, 
uh, but uh, we are 100 percent sure with certain fish and certain jellyfish. So how artificial intelligence works, just a little brief thing so you can kind of like understand where we're going, is that artificial intelligence um, uh, it takes, uh, takes points and calculates uh, different points uh, um, uh, on, on, on different metrics and different uh, derivatives. And basically what that means is that, as I mentioned, we do not fully understand the human genome, but we are beginning to. So it will only be a matter of time before we figure out, okay, what uh, ages us, what doesn't age us. And then once we've isolated those specific genes with CRISPR, we can begin to edit them. So. I'm not that worried um, about uh, um, about the decrease uh, in in population. I have no idea though when this uh, technology uh, will go mainstream and also how uh, how governments will react to it because uh, you know certain governments like like Japan will I guess embrace this while other governments uh, might might uh, might only want it for the elite. Um, and, and th that it's really pricing at first the elite get it and then maybe the middle class gets it and maybe the lower class never gets it. So the, the implementation of immortality is indeed a little bit more tricky. But getting back indeed on the, the future um, of men and women, it is indeed troublesome. So um, we do not know exactly when this technology uh, will get implemented. Um, but as, as far as declining birth rates, um, I'm not that worried about it. I'm, I'm more worried about the men and women who, who, who will still be alive in the future and who will be fighting each other and who will still be in gender wars and who will be alone, angry at the world and pissed off uh, um, at each other. Th that, that is more my concern um, because indeed, the, the the immortality thing is coming, but we do not know how it will be implemented. That's the big question mark. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start winding this down because I'm getting a little bit tired. <laughs> so it's uh, it's around two thirty my time in the morning. Um, so in terms of um, your documentary, w do you have any other closing remarks? Anything you want to talk about in terms of the documentary itself? Um, let me think. Um, Um, oh, um, a, a, a little bit um, um, about the Me Too movement. Um, um, maybe indeed f f from 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 different uh, 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 from different perspectives. Because I don't know if you are familiar with Napoleon Hill. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, he wrote a book, uh, Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. And he discovered indeed that uh, every highly successful person or almost every highly successful person that he interviewed had a very high sexual nature, but um, uh, they were able to redirect mm -hmm. that sexual energy into productivity. So one of my big fears with the Me Too movement um, is that if this continues on, that we are going to take out our best of the best. And this is where I think we might agree on where the decline of the West, where I do not see China uh, falling into this uh, trap, um, and I do not see India um, also falling uh, um, uh, falling into this trap of you know the Me Too uh, movement and and really progressing it to the point where it's uh, uh, where it becomes unsustainable. But I do see that like if the West really does continue um, to, to really continue on into the Me Too movement and that um, even though you know good things happen from it, um, if we start to pathologize you know every um, um, every trigger warning and every time a woman feels unsafe at a certain point just like men with the MGTOW the top men are going to start opting out and once that happens then indeed the West has a serious problem because then they will not be able to compete uh, with with other countries uh, such as China and that that indeed I believe if we continue this way, that will be 
the, the, the fall of the West, where we indeed um, hold back uh, the, the, the top performing members uh, of our society. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that, um, I think that the men on top, I think if they start transmuting their sexual energy and using it um, constructively for their own ends and to do the things that they want to do, um, I think society can be a lot better. But I think society is going to be very, very different. I mean, you know, for me personally, you know, I could go out and I could have a girlfriend in a week and I could be married in six months to a year. I could do all these things. I could, I could have kids in a few years if I really wanted to. But at the same time, it gets to the point where I'm just tired. I'm tired of going through all these different people. I'm tired of, like, going through the same experience and realizing it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And I just can't, I can't do that. Like, it, it drives me absolutely crazy. So I've focused all of my own energy into bettering myself and into, um, you know, building my own businesses and setting myself up financially so I have a life a little bit easier so for me personally, like I've gone through 15 years of long-term relationships. And for me, it's not even so much about finding somebody that's compatible and, and to love and all this kind of stuff. For me, it's just, I'm tired of it. I'm really, really tired of it. It's just, it drains all of my energy and it creates emotional drama and it destroys me, my resources and it doesn't give me any real fulfillment. And I think if, if men can get to that point, you know, like the top guys, the, the, you know, the chads, they can get all the attention. They, they do it because they've always had that option. Or, you know, maybe they're in high school, they, they work out, and then all of a sudden these women start coming to them. That was my experience growing up for the most part. I didn't have to approach women. Women approached me my entire life. That's pretty much been the way it's been. And so I think, I think if, if guys like me who don't have to go out and approach women and who are still being approached by women are done, then I think society, it's not that society has a hard, is going to have a big problem. I think it's, you know, women, you know, that want guys, that approach those guys that they want are going to, are going to freak because they'll be rejected. And they, they, that's something they never really experienced before and they don't understand. You know, I reject women not by telling them anything anymore. Like I don't even waste my effort. I just kind of play games by, you know, being kind of aloof and being indifferent to, to their advances and it drives them even more crazy they they have they keep upping their game and changing the way they act around me and trying to trying to be the female chameleon around me i mean if you're looking at places like china like you're saying we're going to compete with china the thing with china is they've got they had the one child policy has pretty much destroyed marriage for most males or a lot of males in that country because of the, you know, the, the imbalance between men and women in that country. Um, if you look at places like India, I don't really know too much about the Indian statistics, but I do know that down in the southeast part of in, or southwest part of India, that birth rates are really rapidly starting to fall. So they're westernizing and they're basically, they want to be affluent and they want to be middle class. So I think that eventually you're going to start to see the same disease of affluence and, and you know, cultural collapse start affecting them as well. Africa, on the other hand, is a completely different thing. I, I, African populations are still going up. And no matter how much technology we give them, no matter how much Tinder we put in their hands, no matter how much porn we give them, even if we had lover bots, I don't think it would really make a difference with regards to their reproductive rates. They're going to keep reproducing and reproducing. And I mean, there's a, I can't remember her name, but she's a, She's a, she's a scientist who studies agricultural trends and studies food scarcity and, and issues with food and agriculture. And she's saying with by 2027, so that's about nine years away now, we're going to have a shortfall in the amount of food and calories we have in this world. It won't necessarily be in North America, Europe, and uh, places like, like India. India a little bit, but uh, places like China... And places like Africa are going to be in deep, deep trouble because they're not going to be having enough calories coming in. And places like South America, North America, Europe, um, and maybe India, depending on how they get their agriculture, uh, are not going to be exporting as many surplus calories to those regions. So you, you're going to see a lot of, you know, 
die off and infighting in places like Africa. China will most likely purchase stuff, you know, and they'll they'll have no choice. They'll have to trade and buy, buy as much food as they can get. But you know, Africa is really the big problem, and that's you know, I think that's really going to skew things because if you have a if you have a world where half the world is African, you're gonna you're gonna start to see, you know, civilization start to decline more and more. I mean, you know, people are gonna say, "Oh, you're saying, man, you're being racist and this and that," but Let's let's look at this realistically. You you the Europeans went into Africa and they built all the infrastructure and they left it there and it just crumbled. Like the the Africans had it all there and it was built for them and they didn't, you know, in a lot of countries they didn't do anything with it except let it fall apart. And there was a, there's a really interesting um interview. I can't remember who did it, but it it shows a Chinese man w- with talking to a black man in an African country and he's saying the exact same thing. He's saying, "You know, the Europeans built all this stuff for you, and it, and you just let it all go to waste and fall apart. You know, if you want it again, you're going to have to build it for yourself, and that's just that's just how it goes, right? Like, well, um, I, I I actually do have a a very uh, interesting perspective of this. As you know, I am black, I am African, and um, I've I've lived in Africa for 13 years. Um, what it is is that. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, the, the, um, the, the current West doesn't know about African history. And to, to kind of um, uh, um, uh, uh, to kind of like challenge that is most people actually don't know that Africans colonized Europe longer than Europeans colonized Africa. Um, Africans colonized Europe for 700 years. Europeans colonized Africa for 500 years. So um, when did this um, happen? When did the Africans colonize Europe? Um, uh, they were called the Moors, and they were from northern Africa. And uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, you can still see um, are African influence. For example, Santa Claus, which which is now very popular um, in in America and in Canada, comes from Saint Nicholas, and Saint Nicholas comes from Turkey. And Turkey, part of it, was colonized by the Moors. And Saint Nicholas uh, um, was a Moor. He was black. Um, so. Um, a lot of things uh, that Africans actually did have been, um, how can I say this, uh, whitewashed. And um, uh, for example, I think it was in, I think it was in the 14th and 13th century. For example, um, most of the books in uh, in, in 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 the world, um, as far as um, the largest exporter, uh, was an African nation. I don't know exactly uh, which one. Um, and and I, I don't know how, how how deep you want to go into this, but uh, the, the parallels are very interesting. Uh, for example, if you look at the empire of Egypt, um, as you know, you, you've talked about this before. You realized when you went to Egypt, like, oh my gosh, these people are black and look at their noses. That is indeed correct. But one of the things that most people don't know is that um, one of the first uh, um, European areas that Egypt colonized were the Greeks. And that's how European civilization began. Then um, uh, the Moors, um, when they colonized, uh, uh, um, uh, so okay, they but colonized well, well, stop, just stop there for a sec. So you're saying that the Africans colonized Greece? Yes, the but, Egyptians they colonized Greece, and that's where your civilization began. So a lot of those beautiful Greek stories uh, and and uh, and and gods actually hold their roots uh, um, in um, in in Egyptian mythology and uh, and Egyptian religion. Well, when I'm when I think about Egypt, and sorry, when I think about the Greeks, I think about blonde-haired, blonde, curly-haired white people with blue eyes that was those are the original greeks the greeks that are there today are not the greeks that were there before they mixed in with slavs and they, be, they basically became something completely different i mean yeah yeah they 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 they, they, they had curly um uh they they had curly hair uh, i'm not sure about the um uh, the, the the blue eyes. The blue eyes actually come uh, more from from the Nordic. Uh, um, the Greeks uh, were Nordic more. Nor- the Greeks looked more uh, like Nordics back then. Hmm? The Greeks looked more like Nordics back then. 
Could be, could be indeed. It, 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 one of the classical traits was indeed the, the, the curly hair. Um, w- what I mean with colonized and, and the, the beautiful Culturally. and the negative thing about colonization is that um, eventually, of like, for example, first you're free, then you're colonized, then you fight the colonizers, but you learn. You know, you take over their thing and you improve it. And then after, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the, the Egyptians colonized the Greeks, uh, the Greeks eventually, um, at a certain time period, fought back, got their independence. And then um, uh, for a certain point in history, they colonized the Egyptians. Um, so, so, so the bat went back. And then the Romans colonized uh, the Egyptians. Um, but w- one of the interesting things to point out is uh, jumping uh, um, uh, to the Moors. Um, the Moors, they colonized Spain. Yes. And what it was is um, in, the, in the Dark Ages, um, a lot of history was lost. And one of the things that that brought people out of the dark ages um, uh, was that the the Moors colonized uh, Spain. They they um, the the Moors had the largest influence out of all the European countries, uh, had the largest influence on Spain. And what happened? Who became the first super power after the Middle Ages? It was the Spanish Empire. So what they did was um, during the colonization they learned. And they learned, and then eventually they fought back, and they took all of that knowledge, um, and and then were able to grow into an empire. So what it is is there there is this constant um, uh, um, uh, uh, back and forth of of power and colonization. But one thing indeed that Europeans must understand is that indeed Africans uh, um, uh, themselves. Um, um, we're we're not stupid or or backwards um, people. One of the things um, and and why the the, the colonization of the the, the Africans was uh, the Moors in particular was different from the colonization uh, that the white people did on Africa. After that, was um, there was a law um, called no one's territory. Um, and that meant uh, that during the colonization of Africa and, and the rest of the world, um, that if the territory was not inhabited, that you could colonize it. Unfortunately, a lot of the world uh, was inhabited. So then they adjusted that rule. And what happened was they added that, like, okay, if the territory is inhabited, but it's inhabited by, um, um, by, 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 how can I say, by primitive tribes, then you can conquer that area. So what happened was that the Europeans, in order to colonize Africa and other areas of the world, in order to match that law, they had to, um, they not only had to colonize it, they had to destroy the infrastructure, they had to destroy the evidence in order to pertain to that law, because otherwise what you're doing is you're, you're, you're just invading civilizations instead of naturally expanding on land. And that's one of the things that have been so destructive. So when the Moors, for example, um, came uh, during the Dark Ages, they did bring some death and destruction. But what they also brought uh, were lots of education. So um, during the Spanish uh, colonization, um, uh, most of the universities that were built in Europe were built in Spain by the Moors. Um, And um, this also started a very lucrative uh, book trade where lots of uh, Moorish scribes would create books and also the Moors were the, the first uh, uh, people in Europe to implement uh, uh, um, um, public libraries. So that for the first time, the middle class got access um, to, um, uh, to libraries, which was already in certain African cities, uh, um, this was already available. Um, and th- th- you're, it's interesting that you actually uh, bring this up because one of the next documentaries that I plan to do is called United Races because I do also see an increase in the polarization um, of, 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 of the races. And in that, um, in what way? I explore um, how all, all races, so including whites, um, how all of them contributed to society. And then um, 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 in the documentary, you will realize that 
every race has contributed um, uh, to society. Some indeed more than others, but every race has done major and powerful uh, um, uh, contributions. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what else to bring up on that topic. You seem to have covered it pretty well. Yeah. Um, but, um, quickly getting back on the um, on, on the thing. It's um, um, y- y- um, your character um, um, is 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 not the the average character of the average man as far as you know walking away from women. It's the the average man works very hard in order to you know put food on the table for women. So the average man works very hard for women. Um, so it's kind of like j- jumping back uh, onto that. So if the uh, average, uh, or I- I- if the average and if the high-performing men get penalized for their masculine ways, uh, uh, and they walk away, they will not be able to find peace, uh, uh, um, l- l- like you do, and like um, some of, of of the people um, in MGTOW, because ultimately um, we are designed for reproduction. That is our number one. Uh, thing instinctively and indeed it would be great that a lot of people would you know uh, become logical in their thinking but um, um, you are familiar with the Tiger Woods stories and the the, the sexual uh, scandals um, that happened right yeah yeah Tiger Woods is the the perfect example of uh, um, of a High, highly successful person redirecting their sexual energy um, into uh, into becoming successful. But the thing is that you can't uh, 100% of the time redirect your sexual energy into the things that you do. It needs a release at some point, yeah. you know. It's, it's so so, and and that's the thing uh, that I'm worried about with the whole Me Too movement and the whole uh, vilification of things. So. Um, one of the things, as a black man, I am generally worried about the demonization of white men, and as a man in general, I'm generally worried about the 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 the, the, the demonization of men in general. Um, so that that is something that is why, like, I think that even though it would be great to say, okay, I'm just going to walk away, I'm going to let civilization burn down, I'm like. Do you really want to live in a civilization that self-destructs? Because I'm thinking that that will also have a negative impact on the men uh, themselves. You know, it's kind of like being on the ship and, and being like, well, I don't care if the ship sinks. Well, yeah, if the ship sinks, you go down with it. You know what I mean? Like everything I think, that- I think it gets to the point where people like become indifferent, where it just doesn't matter anymore. We stop caring. I think, I think that's really what you're, you're seeing. You're seeing most men in uh, in the West becoming demasculinized, and they're becoming totally indifferent, like the the beautiful ones in the in the most utopia experiments. They just don't care anymore. Like it gets to the point where you just you see women suffering. Like uh, what was it? There's a there's a story that happened a few weeks ago in the UK uh, where a woman um, she's like a fashion CEO for some company. She's on the on the subway and some. Asian guy who's most likely from the Middle East because the article didn't really mention where he was from was attacking her and uh, two middle class white guys saw what was going on and they just got up and they left they stopped caring and so she doesn't care about the fact that this Middle Eastern or Asian guy was attacking her she doesn't blame the attacker she blames the two white guys for not helping her and and she she basically is trying to get the police to find the to go through the footage and find who these guys are so she can pretty much publicly shame them for not giving her the attention and the and the and the help that she really wanted from them right so it's it's really interesting how men are just they're just going to stop caring it's getting to that it's getting to that point right now and yeah it it it, it has gotten to that point i 100% uh, agree what country with are you in hmm? you're in the are you in the netherlands Yes, yes, I'm in the Netherlands. Yeah, so I don't know what it's like in the Netherlands, but uh, I mean, it's a it's a it's a advanced culture, and there's a lot of interesting places that I've wanted to film, um, you know, especially like stuff that I've seen. Uh, it, it's it's not Ho- Holland has the Amsterdam, or is it Netherlands has Amsterdam? Oh, well, it's 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 tricky, right? It's like we're called the Netherlands, we're the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, 
um, um, actually also includes uh, uh, Suriname and and the Antilla, uh, but like technically we're also called Holland. Okay. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's like a tricky thing, but. To keep things simple, Holland and the Netherlands are the same, and yes, um, Amsterdam is our capital. Yeah. Yes. So you know, it, 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 there's a ton of places that I I want to film in Amsterdam. There's tons of really interesting um, adaptive reuse buildings, and uh, there's tons of amazing architecture there. So and true, they, true. So yes. I mean, even more so than other parts of Europe. There's very few parts of Europe that I find as interesting as North America. And everyone's like, well, you know, you should travel to, to Europe and film. I'm like, yeah, but it's just castles and monasteries and, you know, it, 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 it's interesting, but it's, like, not as interesting as, like, weird things that you'd find in the middle of a desert because, you know, crazy people showed up trying to find gold and all these weird dreams and, you know, things that they had. <laughs> they kind of... Have, have, have you been to Namibia by any chance? No. Oh man, you should go because I mean, what you just said is actually is that what happened. A... What happened in Namibia? So I, I used to live in Namibia, and um, at, at least you know, if we are on the travel thing right now, yeah. what it what it is is that um, uh, is there a mining know. town full of uh, buildings that are abandoned with sand yeah. coming through them? Yeah, yeah I've yeah, seen I've seen those in National Geographic. The only issue is, um, you know, when you travel to do stuff like that. I, I mean, I've traveled through like Egypt, and you know, it's. Even even though it's got infrastructure and it's relatively safe, it's still not safe. So there's parasites all over the place, and you've got to worry about. Oh, and the Nibia, the Nibia, the Nibia is safe. It's 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 really uh, the Nibia is is one of the safer uh, um, uh, countries, especially for for white people. Um, um, so the Nibia in general, like you know, almost all over the Nibia, um, is uh, is is safe. Um, with Kenya, you know, it's a little bit more tricky, you know, there's yeah. like, you know, if you go to the wrong places, you know, stuff indeed might happen. Uh, but Namibia, the Namibia is, is, is quite safe. And also, you know, th th there are no um, special viruses or infectious diseases. It's not tropical. It's, it's desert. So, um um, yeah, Namibia. I, if you want to really see something interesting, I would definitely recommend uh, you go there to the ghost town where um, it was one of the few places on Earth where you would, in the past, be able to wait uh, in the moonlight and see the diamonds in the sand, hmm. and then they would pick that up. So yeah, that uh, um, out in the middle of the desert, a a, a a town was was built and then suddenly um abandoned yeah okay no i mean it's interesting but it's just it's not it, like i've got other places on my list before i even like i mean my another idea was to travel all over australia through the entire outback and and drive <laughs> along that so you know it just when, when i when you get used to certain types of travel it becomes very difficult especially if you're if you're you know you're shooting three or four videos a day so when I'm when I'm doing that much content, it's really difficult to, to unless you have the infrastructure to travel around really quickly, to see that many places in one day, and manage all your files and do it for like ten or fifteen days in a row. It's very very difficult, especially because I I'm very restricted on my time based on how many videos I put out all the time. So when I do go on a vacation or when I travel, it's like my time is extremely well managed. Like I can't. Like traveling to a country would like, you know, to see two or three things, it would take me like three or four days. So it's not really, it wouldn't give me enough material to, to film. I mean, someday maybe, but I've got like, you know, if I, people are telling me go to Japan. And I'm like, if I go to Japan, I'll have to be there for three weeks to a month. And it'll just be like, I'll have to film enough content to basically put out for the next two years if I, if I film, you know, so anyway. <laughs> 